this peaking crowd right now. The ears splitting before match point. Londa. Jim. Peterson again. Block! Boilermakers do it! They survive the upset with a three-set run to win in five and advance to the Sweet 16 for the third consecutive year. The block by Purdue and the Boilermakers are moving on! Welcome back to the Dig City Podcast. Corey Palm, head coach Dave Shondell uh, coming to you live from Mackey. Not really live, but from Mackey. Arena, the, the volleyball offices here in Mackey, as uh, it's finally here, Coach. Um, just a couple days away. I know you guys get on the road Thursday, uh, heading a little bit south for, for the season opener. Before we get to, to that and previewing this weekend, uh, just sort of, uh, I, I know the last time we talked, it was day three of camp. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got several more days in the rearview mirror. Uh, uh, thoughts on the team at this point? Well, I think we've learned a lot during that uh, amount of time. I don't know if we've learned enough yet. It just seems like the, you know, the 15 or 16 days that the NCAA is providing a volleyball team to get ready to go play major competition is, uh, is a little bit limiting, but it's all the same for everybody. So I guess that we're, we're equal there. My, my concern, Corey, right now is that as everybody I think in the country seems to understand, we don't have a lot of experience back. Uh, we graduated seven players and a transfer that did the bulk of the playing for our team the past couple of seasons. Where the teams that we're gonna play, especially Bowling Green and Loyola of Chicago, two really good volleyball teams, have almost their entire squads back. And Bowling Green virtually is the exact same team from a year ago. Uh, you know, they've got some middles that they're going to replace, but uh, their dog and pony show, they're outside hitters, they're pin players, and they're all back. Their setter's back, the libero is back, and they were two points away from winning the MAC championship mm -hmm. a year ago. Loyola is in a similar situation. They have to replace some setters, which is, which is critical, but every other player is back, and they've got some fast, high-flying uh, athletes and, and some really physical pin uh, middle attackers. So those are our first two teams that we're going to play, and um, you know I think we'll be more athletic. I think we'll be bigger and more physical, and and I like the fact that our ball control has improved dramatically. Um, you know even since the end of last season, with some new faces, mm -hmm. but uh, just slightly concerned about we're going to play some real experienced team teams. And it will be the first time on the floor for, for some of our players in a, in a real tough situation. Well, some new faces in ball control and also a small group. Uh, when, when you've only got four you know, right. dedicated back row players, does that, is that sort of a blessing in disguise in that they're getting a lot more reps in practice? They're, they know their role? Well, the, the blessing is just who they are and the attitude and the behavior that they're showing and the improvement that they're making. I, I, I stopped practice last night and, and let everybody know that these four players are leading our team right now. They're the ones that are coming in every single day at practice and playing their tails off mm -hmm. and making plays and, and keeping us in system. And so that's, that's a huge positive. If you know anything about volleyball at this level, to have ball control people that are zoned in every time they come into the gym mm -hmm. and they're, they're, they're passing serve very well, they're serving tough, they're making defensive plays, it makes the whole practice so much better. It makes your team so much better. So from Skimmerhorn to Horning to Torrance to Brown, those four are doing everything they can to give our team a chance to have a great season. I've always, that's always made me kind of chuckle about volleyball at this level. It, it's, there's an old adage in golf that you, you drive for show, but you putt for dough. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of applicable here. You know, the front row players get all the attention, but a lot of times you sink or swim based on your ball control, how your back row players perform, whether or not they're getting any yeah. notice at all. Now, virtually every, every time uh, you step on the floor that um, those kind of players, your libero and a couple DSs, are going to be the difference makers because – when you talk to a coach before any match, they're going to talk about the serve pass game. That's what's going to dictate your success, and, and it normally does. Um, 
unless you're just far superior or far weaker than somebody. Um, so, but I, I, we feel really good. I mean, I think our entire staff has just been um, so impressed with uh, the improvement we've made in that area. And when we thought Skimmer Horn would be steady, she has gotten become so much quicker, so much more athletic. That some of that comes with confidence, just sure. knowing knowing what to do and making the right moves. Horning is um, just a totally different person than she was a year ago. We talked about that before. Mm -hmm. And then the two smaller uh, DSs, one's five one and one's about five four and a half, quicker than all get out, just scooping balls up from everywhere and 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 just playing their hearts out. So yeah. that that's a good place to begin. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Are you set on a libero at this point, or? Well, I, I think we're set for the first match. Okay, uh, it would be Maddie Skimmerhorn, and I, and I, I've told our staff during the course of the of the past two and a half weeks, I think she can be as good of a libero as we have ever had, um, and and that's saying something because we've had we've had some great ones, but she has as much athleticism as any we've ever had. And now she's playing with this with this great belief, and she's a leader. And and you know, people know who to look for on our team when they're when they're looking for leadership. And it starts with Skimmerhorn. Pretty good size for a libero too at five yeah, ten. Yeah, five ten, long arms. Yeah. But her her ability to drive in front for balls is terrific. And she's got great range left and right, and can dig with her hands as well as drive for balls. So, going to be a great player. How's the setter <laughs> position looking? Well, we got three. You know that that are in the race and. Um, Meg Renner was who we kind of thought would always have that spot. And then we had the transfer come in with Grace Ball and Seifer. And then, of course, Sydney M is, is working really, really hard to, to be a factor in that race as well. But if we, if we go with one setter, um, I think we would probably start Renner. Um, she's had a really good past week and a half. Um, was a little, little sloppy early, but she's been really, really good. Narrowed her focus. And, is, is uh, locating the ball really well for us. Balance Seifer can flat play, mm -hmm. um, but she's more of a two uh, setter system player because she's a little, little smaller than we'd like to have in the front row against Big Ten competition. She would be, you know, okay against you know some of the non-conference opponents that we play. But if we go with one setter, I think we would start um, Renner. If we go with two setters, it would probably be Renner and most likely Balance Seifer because they they have a little more experience than what Sydney has. Okay. Um, <clears throat> last time we talked, we broke down the roster based on you know returners versus newcomers versus yeah. versus freshmen. Um, it, it, we're kind of going through position by position now. How are the middles looking? Um, look, Raven Colvin is you know big time athlete. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, you know she'll get a lot of attention. But she's really, really good in front of the setter, and, and we're working really hard to make her a, a better slide attacker, going off one foot behind. And there's no reason she shouldn't be, as she's a freak uh, athletically. And uh, blocking-wise, I've been really impressed with her. She works as hard and covers as much ground as any middle we've had here at Purdue. And we've had Catino, and we've had, you know, Faye Elijah, who was quick. We had Fisher. We had, you know, Lynch. We've had some really good, good middles. But uh, she is so quick and so competitive that she gets to a, a lot of balls and plays so much bigger than her six one, you know, height would indicate. Uh, the second middle is is great competition. Um, it kind of goes back and forth. Experience wise, you've got Hannah Clayton that transferred from Iowa, started for four years there. We've talked about her already, uh, but she has had three or four really good days where she's kind of risen to the top of, of that group of three that are fighting for that spot. Uh, she doesn't block as big, even though she's one of the all-time leading blockers in Iowa history, doesn't block nearly as big as what Lourdes Myers and Lizzie Carr do. Those guys are, you know, they're touching 10, 10, five and a half, 10, six and a half. And so they play big and they, they probably might be better blockers if they know where they're supposed to be at that time. But the experience factor that um, Clayton has, and Clayton's really good offensively. She can go in front and go behind. She's quick as a cat, and uh, and she's been been through it. She's played against you know for four years. She's she's played in eighty Big Ten matches, so um, you know she would probably be where we would start in that two spot. And then I think Lourdes Myers, who's had who's kind of breaking out of her shell uh, here lately, which is a wonderful thing to see. But Lizzie Carr is is really far ahead of where we thought. She would be. You know, okay. she's a six-six freshman that 
Um, we knew it was going to be a project, but she's less of a project than we thought. That's great. That's a pleasant surprise. Yeah, yes, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, um, and then the outside, uh, I know you know our fans are a little bit more familiar with some of those names. Uh, yeah. Uh, how well, how are they looking? Three so for far? sure, and you know they're going to fill three spots. Yeah. You got six players to fill three spots, which I think we will do handsomely. Um, Matty Cook is probably the most physical, the hardest hitter and uh, on a given night could play at the highest level. Uh, Matty Chin's probably been our best player so far mm -hmm. in our camp, hitting for the highest percentage. And um, just, again, talked about it. she had some shoulder issues that kind of, I think emotionally and physically bogged her down. And now the word is that, you know, through an MRI that it's not as bad as what it, they thought it might be. And she, she just needs to go out and play. Mm -hmm. And she's been <clears throat> really good involved in her entire game, both serve-receive, uh, defensively blocking and attacking. Uh, Emma Ellis, who probably played the most of those three during the last uh, previous three seasons, has great nights. And then she has nights where, you know, she's having a hard time getting around a block. And we, we do feel like we block pretty well. Mm -hmm. And if you add our two practice players, our two guys, the big O and the K man, then you've got uh, some pretty good blockers over there. So she's got to continue to work on keeping the ball out in front a little bit where she can see the block and still get good hand contact on the ball. But you know, obviously she's, she's a gamer, and so I, I know she, she will be ready. So those are the three seniors. And then you uh, go to a redshirt uh, freshman in Emily Rastovsky, and Emily is a much improved player, very physical, has herself in great condition. She's touching around 10-3 okay. and hitting the ball really, really hard. Just has a few more things to learn before, you know, she's going to be able to, I think, really battle for a uh, playing opportunity. Eva Hudson, one of the true freshmen, is uh, one of the best recruits we've ever had at Purdue. And uh, she's a really, really good player and can do everything, you know, kind of like um, – I don't know what you would call it, a five-tool player in baseball. You yeah. know, that's kind of what she is in volleyball. You know, plays, plays the whole game very well and I think has a high ceiling mm -hmm. to continue to get better. And then the other um, outside hitter is Brielle Warren. And if you've watched any of our scrimmages, you know that she absolutely hits the tar out of the ball. Uh, she's going to be a great player for us eventually here. How quickly that happens is just how many reps can she get and how can she – learn as she goes. The, the block seems to be a, a problem for her right now. She hits a, a hard, heavy ball, but she's got to start learning a few more shots. And those are the things you come in as a freshman, and when you're six one and a half and you touch 10 foot four like she does, you haven't had a lot of problems with block in high school and club. Right. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you're seeing you know people that look just like you and maybe even bigger that are understanding the game and how to block you, and then you've got to, you've got to develop, you've got to learn. And I think that's uh, kind of the, the sequence we're in right now with, with her as well. Okay. You mentioned the scrimmages. You had, you had two scrimmages each of the last two weekends. Uh, what's your approach on those, and, and, and what types of things are you looking to learn about your team in those? Well, it's, it's different every year. You know, you know, last year we pretty much had our lineup figured out. Yeah. We're talking here today. We play in, in two days. I don't know what the lineup is. And that's, that's the honest truth. I don't know where our lineup is going to be. We don't even know what our system is going to be. Is that bad coaching? No, it's, it's great, great depth that we have. And a lot of people that are working really hard to play. And, um, you know, I, I think what, what's nice is we could run a one-setter one system or a two-setter system. And I think that we're designed to run either one of them. Or we can mix it up during the course of even one particular game. Um, you know, go with one and then maybe at cr crucial times put a bigger right side player in and put Grace in the back row for um, the, the, you know, the opposite and, and go there. Um, but I, I think that all year long it'll be kind of an evolving situation that uh, we're going to do whatever works best for us based on who we're playing and how our, our athletes are performing in, in matches and in practice. But um, there's not a lot of room, a lot of difference between player one and player 17. It's, it's never been as close. And I'm, I'm not saying it's because we don't have any great athletes, because we do. I think right. athletically, this team is as good as we've had at Purdue. And, and that, that's a big deal because we've had, you know, we recruit athletes. That's how we operate here at Purdue. But we have a lot of really, really talented athletes. And we got to figure out what system works and, and who plays the best. And, and that's been our goal all season is how quickly can we go from a bunch of new players coming in here together, just being dumped on the floor, and coming in here to 
who plays well together, who understands their role and, and how they're going to make each other better on the court. And we've come a long way with that. One thing we've talked about a little bit in the past and I find fascinating, so I'm going to talk about it again. You mentioned we're two days out. We don't even necessarily know what system we're going to go with. Is that something you would have felt comfortable with 10 years ago? It, it, it's the evolution of yourself as a coach, the evolution of where coaches yeah. get more comfortable is not the right word, but no, I understand but you, what you're, you're what comfortable you're in your own skin. I, I think that once you have the talent and you have you've had some success, you probably become a little more comfortable knowing that things will evolve and you'll get to where you want to go. Um, my my biggest concern right now is that we're playing these two teams that have a lot of experience mm-hmm. and, um, and and are good. I mean, they, these are. The best thing about this first weekend is I think all three of these teams are going to win 20-plus matches, and two of them might win 25. Yeah. And so that's great for your RPI. If you can, if you can win two or three of those, right. it's really good for your RPI. So we're putting ourselves in a position, it's just a little bit early, to, for our team to necessarily expect to play at the top of their game. Although... That's my expectation mm-hmm. is when we put them on the floor is that we're going to play at a really high level and we're going to compete. Um, but I, I just know that there's two teams that are, are not necessarily big names across the country in, in volleyball, though Bowling Green has been really good for a long time. Loyola is, is making a name for themselves right now. And then you've got the host team, yeah. Tennessee, waiting in the wings after we have about a two-hour break after playing Loyola on Saturday. I was going to talk about the schedule next. Bowling Green, 10.30 uh, uh, Friday morning. Then you've got the rest of Friday off. Yeah. Well, to watch <laughs> to watch teams play. For sure. Yeah. You'll, yes. Yeah. Uh, the rest of Friday to scout. Um, then you've got Loyola at 1 o'clock on Saturday, and you turn right around. The host team schedules these tournaments, yep. and they schedule them the way they do. And yep. then you play Tennessee in the nightcap, six o'clock yep. Eastern. And and you know that's all part of the, of the growing uh, as a team. And when you go on the road, and again we we had to go back to Tennessee. They came and played here last year. Yep. We played them on a Saturday when neither team played all day long. So it was pretty pretty good situation for both teams. Mm-hmm. This is a, a situation where we're going to have to find some some toughness, which is what. Our goal has been all season with this group. We've got to get tough. We've got to learn how to compete. We've got to learn how to fight. Because in our league, so many sets and so many matches are going to come down to a couple of points. And we have to figure out how to get them. Yeah. And so in one way, I think it's great that we're going to be put into that situation. Uh, other hands, I'm, other, way, other time, I'm a little concerned about it. But I, I also know that players play. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's not going to be because we're not in good, good condition. It's just we have enough time to prepare, turn around and prepare, get a pregame meal, get all those things done. I know the people that handle logistics around here are having more problems with it than I am. Sure. I think we'll be okay. You just got to gotta get to the point where you roll the balls out and let's go. Yeah. And they're worried about meals and yeah. travel and transportation. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, all three matches can be heard uh, on WSHY here locally in the Lafayette area yeah. and, and online, Kyle. Shondell will be calling the action for yes, from will Knoxville. Uh, the Tennessee match can be seen on SEC Network Plus, so they'll be streaming yeah. at least that one. Um, we have to get to a point, Corey, and I don't know if you're getting at this or not, but if if we host a tournament, we should be streaming every match. Yes. What's the difficulty there? Yeah. E- e- even if you're not putting a play-by-play guy on it for whatever reason, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, our, our fans in today's world of technology – should be able to watch every single one of our matches. If they want to, if people want to charge for it, that, you know, I guess they got a right to do that. But there are so many great matches now in the world, and volleyball has become such a priority for a lot of people. They want to see teams play. Yeah. And uh, I think our, our fans would like to see us play Bowling Green, who's going to maybe win the MAC this year if they can beat Ball State. Uh, and Loyola, who has now moved to the Atlantic 10 Conference, where they were picked third behind uh, Dayton and Vermont. Uh, VCU. But, okay. Um, those are going to be great matches yeah. for our young team. And uh, it's just too bad that we're not to a point yet in volleyball. And that's not because of the volleyball coaches or because of necessarily the SIDs. It's mm-hmm. probably some other people that are, that are dictating whether or not those are going to be streamed. But I like to think, and I don't know what we're doing, but let's, let's try to make sure when we're back here in another week that we're going to put all of our matches out so Dude, people can watch them. Doing all we can to make that happen. Yeah. I know that's been a, a – <clears throat> 
that conversation has been having been being had on the national level this week because yeah. there's a small handful of top 25 matchups that yeah. aren't going to be able to be seen right. anywhere. And that doesn't make any sense because mm-hmm. people want to see him, and it's not it's not an expensive venture. Right, right. Um, one last thing uh, that has happened since the last time we talked is the preseason poll came out. I made it the last thing because I know what polls are worth. Mm-hmm. They they mean they don't mean nothing. Yeah. But they don't mean a whole lot at this point in the season. You want to see your name, but it, it's also not like you've you've arrived because you're in the preseason top 25 poll. That said, the Boilermakers 13th when the preseason poll came out. Just uh, Tennessee, by the way, just outside, they received a whole fistful of votes there. They're 29th or so. Yeah. So so a good matchup. But but your thoughts there on, on uh, when you saw that ranking? Uh was a little surprised we were as high as 13 um, because I saw what happened in the Big Ten poll with the coaches. But I think a lot of people um, look at that preseason poll and they go back and they look at last year's finish and that's where they start. And it's we actually dropped as much as any team mm-hmm. from last year's finish uh, to the beginning this year. And again, it's all based on the fact that we lost seven of our top seven regular players. Right. Um, you know, Colvin, who emerged late, and Skimmerhorn are really the only two players that anybody would recognize if they walked into a gym uh, in the Big Ten. Uh, and maybe they wouldn't recognize both of them. I don't know. But um, I get that, mm-hmm. and, and, I, and I don't care. I, I, I think that um, our team will earn what they get. That's the way it normally operates. And uh, I, I think, I mean, I, I'm sitting here with you feeling pretty good about our team. I know early in the year it will, it will be a challenge to beat people. But I think if we can hang together um, and, and continue to work hard and develop, you know, these people continue to develop, the athletes continue to develop like they are, um, we can match up with anybody. Yep. I mean, there's not anybody that I feel like right now we can't match up with. And the more experience they get, the more that, that some of these younger players that haven't been on the floor against great competition learn, then we're going to get better and better. So. Preseason poll is exactly what it is, and it's kind of a you know a blind draw for the most part. But in another couple of weeks, it'll start to make more sense. Get a chance to get better this weekend down at Tennessee Bowling Green again, ten thirty in the morning Friday. Loyola Chicago one o'clock on Saturday, and Tennessee in the nightcap at, at six p.m. Coach, good luck. Travel safely. Thank you. Look and, forward uh, to seeing you when we come back for the uh, our big event. And that'll be our first home event. Just to touch on that, yes, briefly. Uh, you know we're. You got Bradley and Utah and, and UW and Milwaukee, and again, all teams that can win a lot of matches this year. So, um, you know, our scheduling is good, mm-hmm. but we got to got to beat people. But uh, we'll we'll come back and and we'll be ready to to play here at home. And normally our first weekend we play at home. This this year we couldn't do it, but we still want to have that kind of hype when we come back and, and have this place rock and rolling. Have this place rock and rolling should have a, a nice. A nice group of people in town next weekend for the big the, big football game. Don't forget about that. I think we're going <laughs> to, you know, at first they didn't think we were going to sell that Penn State game out. People were telling me, no, nah, it's a Thursday night. It's just so hard to, to sell those out. And then that, it's changed a little bit. It has. Looks like it's going to be a packed place here. So grab your tickets for that one uh, early on Thursday night and then hang around and watch some good volleyball on Friday and Saturday. Can't wait. Yeah. Thanks, Coach. Corey. Thank you. Uh, we'll catch you down the road. Boiler okay. up. Boiler up.